So I, I would like to talk uh, about some unusual properties uh, I have discovered during my research, uh, named um, nanocomposites and layered structures, uh, mainly on the acoustic properties. Well, we all know that uh, acoustic or sound waves are omnipresent in uh, matter. They uh, easily propagate in the medium, they carry energy, momentum, and different information. They interact uh, with a large number of other kinds of excitations and have an extremely broad range of applications. Uh, well, they cover a different length scale from seismology to nanotechnology. And uh, at nano scale, we know that uh, temperature and uh, also low temperatures, the quantum properties of uh, these waves and phonons are revealed themselves. And uh, for instance, we can cite here some uh, works uh, where they serve as a universal quantum transducers coherently linking a broad array of quantum dots, qubits. Due to low uh, dissipation, uh, nano and micro mechanical systems are integrated into electronic and optical circuits, the detectors of atomic scale displacements and masses, electric and magnetic fields, or power detectors. For instance, uh, a minimal detectable power of as low as 10 to the minus 19 watts is obtained in so-called hot electron microbolometers I will talk about, and that's uh, achieved at uh, temperatures as low as uh, 100 millikelvin. And uh, as low energy excitations, uh, the acoustic phones are dominating the thermal vibration spectrum in at such temperatures. Here, you see an outline of a device, which is a radiation detector, a bolometer, uh, the, it uh, contains the absorbing element, which is a normal metal strip, or in this case, it's a copper, which is supported by an insulating membrane of silicon nitride and all together are in the air, a range of uh, dozens or even hundreds of nanometers. Uh, the absorbed radiation, as this is a metal strip, uh, primarily goes into the electronic subsystem, which has a low heat capacity, and that's why it increases rapidly its temperature relative to the crystal lattice. Here you see the difference. This difference drives the flux between the two subsystems, so the energy should be somehow dissipated into the phonons. However, the bolometer works in the sense that it it must uh, react or be sensitive to minute uh, powers. And uh, this dissipation is a kind of a bottleneck. We need a controllable cooling of this device. So you, in the blue, you see this uh, cooling structure also mounted on the system and the red fingers, which are absorbing uh, the bulk of the heat. Uh, the principle is based on a voltage biased uh, NIS uh, quantum junctions, which lift the hot electro the Fermi um, energy of the normal state higher so that the hot electrons can escape into the superconductor. So that's the principle. However, as I said, uh, the sensitivity of such devices requires uh, somehow an understanding of how the phonons are interacting with electrons. As you see in the cross section here, the structure is basically one of a layered uh, compound. In the lower graph, you see the uh, SEM uh, image. In, um, the, the, the lateral scales is micrometers, while the transverse scale is nanometers, as I said. So, as this is uh, a nanometer scale, we do just a simple estimate to realize that at uh, mentioned temperatures, the phonons are not quite bulk phonons because their wavelength compares to the thickness. 
And this is a cold uh, crossover temperature, the T star here. Uh, it falls below one Kelvin. Uh, well, what are these phonons? They're certainly different from the bulk ones. Uh, in the 90s, there have been some theoretical works uh, to demonstrate how the heat is dissipated in bulk materials from electrons to the phonons. And what they have found was uh, such a power formula with the temperature of electron gas and phonon gas being different. And uh, the exponent alpha is somehow around five by theory. And the sigma is a coefficient. I would like to draw your attention to the dependence on the materials, material parameters. Here is the density of the structure, but uh, C is the density of uh, the speed, the phase speed of phonons. So it's a rather strong dependence on phonon properties. What uh, has been realized uh, in recent years is that by reducing or confining the structures to the nanoscale in the thin films, nanocomposites, the electron phonon heat transfer is increased drastically, orders of magnitude, as well as the exponent alpha is changing, becomes uh, somehow fitted between 4 and 4.5, so it's lower than the bulk. Uh, while the dependence on material parameters uh, which are used in the structure, I mean, uh, the copper deposited on some insulator and so on, uh, this is very poorly investigated. When we mention this, we expect that uh, by increasing the thickness of our layers, we move towards the bulk. So the confined phonons uh, are becoming more and more deconfined. So according to this rule here, we expect that uh, the electron phonon coupling will decrease, the power will drop. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that's not what is observed experimentally. You can see here uh, in red, the, a few uh, thickness uh, dimensions of the membrane M1, and 3 M5, and in the view graph, they are represented by the curves. And uh, here you see the relation between the respective uh, power densities. They are uh, not at all uh, following the trend of the thicknesses. On, on the contrary, they behave, behave uh, uh, non-homogeneously, uh, non-uniformly. This is a kind of paradox, and that's about uh, uh, raises the question, what's going on? Uh, I should also mention that the problem uh, was uh, considered in various experimental and uh, theoretical numerical studies, uh, although uh, you should realize that uh, uh, we have much too many parameters here. Even a simple, so-called simple two-layer structure contains uh, is a, contains an eight-dimensional space uh, describing the phonons. We have the thicknesses of the layers, the mass densities, elastic constants, with, which uh, define the properties of the phonons. So it's hopeless uh, to consider the whole space of these parameters. That's why we needed an analytical solutions, solution. And that's why we tried to consider the problem uh, within uh, the framework of the elasticity theory describing the phonons, uh, which is a well-established theory for, for the sound waves in uh, confined media. And in our model, the uh, electrons are described by uh, three-dimensional standard family theory. Uh, the model is uh, the simplest model consists of two layers of, say, copper or silicon nitride, and uh, the uh, acoustic waves are propagating uh, in, within the plane. And here is the quantized version with the amplitudes and the propagation wave number in plane. So this is the setup. 
this is a little bit uh, a reminder of what is uh, elasticity theory about. It's simple, uh, describes uh, elastodynamic equations in the continuum medium. And uh, the, uh, basically it's a, a const uh, the, the Newton equation, simple, but tensorial. Here you see the stress tensor, the strain tensor, they are related linearly. And uh, uh, this describes in the bulk, uh, in, it's easy to check, it describes in standard uh, uh, bulk waves where S and L here depend on the bulk parameters in this way here in the corner. And uh, the solutions for the plates for single, simple layer structure are well known, uh, although they uh, um, are not so simple. They must still uh, being considered uh, in calculations. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's very difficult to extract analytic expressions from this stuff. Uh, in the view graph here in the lower right corner, you see the red lines showing the bulk dispersions and what happens to the spectrum. It's split, it consists of many branches where this is the frequency of a phonon. And here you have split off for the uh, gapped modes, which are called sometimes uh, cut off modes, and a few uh, uh, gapless modes, uh, which starts from zero here. These are classified as dilatational or symmetric, as you can see in the graph, and anti-symmetric flexural. We'll return to this later a little bit. And so our system is a little bit more complicated as we have uh, two layers, uh, then in two layers you have more, well, more uh, material parameters, which I've mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, of course, there are many uh, approaches and methods which are used to solve such equations. It's a uh, long lasting uh, uh, situation. However, what uh, one ends up in our case is a complicated eight by eight matrix when one uses um, expansion in partial waves like here. And it's again, not usable for our purpose in analytics. That's why we devised uh, a new method which gets rid, rid of half of these uh, equations by somehow a trick which uh, uh, consists in looking for uh, basis functions which automatically satisfy some of the boundary conditions. Which are the boundary conditions? You have forces on the surface of the plates and on the interfaces. So we managed to get rid of those on the surface of a free plate, which means that zero forces on, are applied to the surfaces. And then, don't be scared, these are just uh, complicated uh, equations, but the point here is to show how it works. Uh, in the argument, you see uh, that uh, when Z, which is a transverse direction across the thickness, uh, when Z is uh, equal to D, the thickness, the surface, here they are defined like that, uh, you get an identical uh, zero for the respective components of the stress tensor. And uh, this means these are still exact, but in further solving the equations, you get some approximate solutions, but still this condition is strictly respected. Well, we managed to solve it analytically in the area which is of most interest for us, meaning the at low temperatures. Uh, at low temperatures, uh, it's the low energy excitations which are relevant. So we may consider the long wavelength excitations. And uh, as my time is coming to the end, uh, I would like to show the few graphs which demonstrate that uh, uh, the dependence on material parameters in the full parametric space still can be represented completely by using the scaled variables. 
meaning that uh, you have you start with a layer, a simple layer denoted by A with a certain dimension, uh, thickness, uh, density, and so on. And you add another layer with different properties by preserving a constant B uh, total thickness. And that's uh, here to the left. You see that for some material parameters of the added layer, in this case, it's a soft layer. So you expect adding a softer layer on a harder layer will reduce the uh, frequencies of the modes. I mean, the in total, uh, the modes will be softening. And that's indeed what happens for some values of S parameter here. While in another area to the right, uh, you get uh, something strange because you add uh, a harder layer to the hard layer, an even harder one, but uh, the frequency is dropping at the initial coating delta, so it softens until at some larger values of delta ratio it starts to increase as expected. This is a kind of strange. Okay, uh, I mentioned earlier that we need to the lowest energy branches, and these are given by the so-called dilatational and flexural waves. And uh, the dilatational mode, which has a linear uh, wave number dependence, behaves quite in a standard way, so it softens when you add a softer layer and so on. But the flexural, which is the lowest possible branch in the spectrum, uh, behaves uh, uh, strongly uh, non-monotonously, depending on the added layer. It has a variation which uh, uh, first uh, increases as a maximum for, for some parameters and then decreases again and has a minimum and then starts increasing. A similar thing happens if you add a, a softer material or a harder material, which is symmetric. Uh, this last view graph probably shows the positions in the full parametric space uh, defined by the scaled parameters of the uh, extrema I have just shown before. Uh, the uh, surface is quite complicated and uh, it tells uh, about a rather non trivial dependence on material parameters. Well, I just mentioned now that. Uh, we plugged in all our results into the formulas obtained earlier for the electron form and heat transfer, and we could reproduce the experimentally observed paradox in the uh, radiation detectors. Now I would uh, just uh, finish with the main conclusion, which is a practical one, that what follows from our uh, investigation is uh, that only the modes with the standard bulk-like sound linear dispersion behave in a standard way, means uh, monotonously, while all the others turned out to be quite non-trivial. Now, my conclusion is uh, that uh, uh, these uh, uh, acoustic waves, as they are so omnipresent and interact with everything, they have to be taken into account, and the non-structure of their behavior is quite non-trivial. Thank you for your attention. Please, if you have questions. You know, you have so small structures, size, I mean, and small temperature. Do you expect some quantum effects or this uh, non-monotonic behaviors probably are due to quantum effects? What is your opinion? A comment, please. Uh, I think it's Mikhail Makovey by the voice because I don't see yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I, in fact, uh, gave the answer to this question during my talk uh, by saying that uh, the nanostructures related to the uh, detectors working indeed 
that such temperatures are strictly quantum. So that uh, when you have this uh, phonon classical problem solved in the last part of my talk, you are just quantizing these uh, results and obtain the quantum phonons. And this is why we could explain the non-monotonous heat power transfer in those detectors, which is observed experimentally, but never explained. So you are right. You are right. The quantum nature is present, and we can describe it. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Thanks. Okay.